eminent series of speakers uh, from that team uh, to talk to us. And I'm sure it's going to prove extremely interesting. Um, so just quickly introducing people, um, not in any particular order. Um, we have uh, Richard Stevenson, um, Property Services Commissioning Manager from City of York Council. Faye Davies, uh, Managing Director from Burrell Foley Fisher. We have Rick Lee, uh, Principal Structural Engineer from Arup. We have Bart Stevens, uh, Director of SGA Consulting. Rob Henderson, who's Project Manager for Vinci. And Professor Kieran Trehan, who's Pro Vice Chancellor, Partnerships and Engagement at the University of York. So uh, a very very highly qualified team of speakers for tonight. Um, could I now hand over to Richard Stevenson, please, um, if you're ready, Richard, to start the talk. Thank you for the introduction, John. Uh, I'm not particularly well qualified, but I'm here and pleased to be here. Uh, my role is normally the commissioning manager for uh, technical services for uh, City of York Council, managing frameworks for um, architecture, structural engineering, quantity surveying and project management. I'm very lucky to be seconded onto this job for the last three years and work with this team, which has been a really, really good experience. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, my role is client side PM. Uh, responsible for delivery of the project. Uh, the main role is to commission and en enable the project design team, uh, facilitate procurement of the main contractor, and once in contract, manage the client interface with all of the parties. Um, the Guildhall, as we'll all know, is one of York's most prestigious, prestigious buildings uh, and a historically significant asset. Uh, this project is a once in a lifetime opportunity to address the poor condition of its historical core and hopefully enable the building to have a commercially viable future. The scheme creates new spaces that increase public access, support small business growth and retains the civic use, providing a sustainable income to conserve and maintain the historic building whilst also providing carbon efficient energy solutions. Uh, can I have the second slide, please, Rick? The Guildhall complex spans six centuries of development on the Riverside. The Riverside contains evidence of two millennia of urban development, evidence of which has shown up during our archeological investigations. Very interesting, but also a little inconvenient. The buildings are listed at grade one, two, and two star, making the site hugely significant. The main elements of complex are the Guild Hall itself, uh, the 19th century Atkinson block, the South Range, the Victorian council offices, including the council chamber, and the post office North Annex. All very different buildings that have been organically evolving into a civic complex over many years. Can I have the third slide, please, Rick? The current image shows four separate elements on the riverside that comprise the Guildhall complex. They are set side by side, accompanied, in fact, I'm actually on the wrong uh, slide now, so I would have to go to the, to the fourth slide, please, if that's possible, Rick. I think I've actually messed up my, uh, my slide uh, pictures and such like. Um, can you go to the one with the um, with the riverside image on, please? That's the one, yeah. The current image shows the four separate elements on the riverside that comprise the Guildhall complex, set side by side, accompanied by an image of the new restaurant block on the left-hand side of the development. You can actually see now that that is taking place for real off Lendl Bridge, and it's uh, a really impressive view from there. Can I have the side, slide four, please, Rick? In April 2013, the council effectively vacated the Guildhall on the opening of new HQ. The only remaining function for the Guildhall was to facilitate <coughs> civic meetings within the council chamber and occasional <coughs> events in the main hall. 
The events in the main hall were limited due to the lack of heating and adequate welfare facilities. To secure the future of the complex and derive maximum value from this key city centre asset, it was decided to renovate the existing building and develop the adjacent site for commercial use, whilst retaining the ongoing civic and community roles. Please can I have slide four, Rick? <sighs> Sorry, five, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the solution to preserving the building and generating the revenue is to provide a robust maintenance programme for the future. I think we've actually got the wrong slide up there again, uh, Rick, it was the one before that. Uh, listed on the slide are actually the drivers for the, um, for, the, for the project, which were on the screen now, retaining council and civic use and improving the main hall environment, which would mean that we could actually let it for a significantly more lucrative uh, income than we have had in the past, just with the uh, ad hoc lettings, with there being no heat and toilets and such like. Uh, a business club was going to uh, maximise the use of the of the office areas, and to, um, to 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 generate some some revenue within the within the old building. Uh, we also looked to provide uh, a new space, which was the old Hutman's area, to uh, derive income from a riverside restaurant and further uh, office accommodation in that area, uh, which also affords the riverside courtyard garden. Uh, please, can I have uh, slide six, uh, Rick, please? Uh, the historic highlights of the complex to be retained, uh, the council chamber, which is shown on the top left of the photograph, uh, room one, the original 14th century structure. Uh, normally, if you found yourself in here, you would either be important or in trouble. Uh, so it wasn't always somewhere you would want to be. Um, the main hall is also on the bottom right. This is the, the place that we are trying to re-energize to, to get maximum return. Uh, please, can I have slide seven? This is the new build to the North Range containing the restaurant and the office extension uh, incorporated in the Riverside Terraces. Uh, this is a large capital investment, which we hope is uh, going to give a long-term revenue generator for the project, uh, and is currently offered to be rented uh, as Shell and Core at the moment. Uh, please can I have uh, slide eight, Rick. Uh, I will now pass you on to the design team to give you more detail on the challenges and solutions to the many issues that we have encountered during this development. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Richard. Um, my name is Faye Davies. Um, I am the Managing Director at BFF. Uh, we were involved in this project from 2015. It was a competition winning entry with an interview, and um, we developed the brief along with York City Council um, as the project developed. Um, so we've been on it for quite some time. So if you go to the next slide, Rick. Thanks. Um, Richard kind of touched on uh, what the challenge was and, and how we um, went about um, coming up with the brief and finalising the design. Um, as you can tell from this drawing, it shows you um, the, the phases of development and what's listed. So uh, Richard said that the medieval um, guild hall, which is purple, is grade one listed. Um, it was built in um, between 1449 and 1459. Um, it was restored after a Bledecker raid um, in 1960. Um, and over the course of time, it's developed and there's been add-ons. So um, you've got the municipal offices, which are red, which grid two star listed. And we class that as a Victorian block. And the blue is the South Range, which is um, listed because it's was used to be a muniment room where we used to store title deeds. And to the left where you see the white area, that's the new build um, block. To go to the next slide, please. So the challenge with this building is obviously its significance and altering a significant, uh, such a significant building can be quite challenging. Um, BFF um, have a skill at unlocking these historic sites and making sure that we repurpose the historic asset um, these are sort of the significances based on um, historic England's conservation principles, uh, which helps us 
understand the layers of history and where the least significant elements of the design could be changed. Go to the next slide, please. So first of all, um, how we look at the site and how we unlock it. And it was just such a challenge to try and uh, make sure that the vision for the site was realized and everyone's aspirations were met. Um, the Guildhall's complex is surrounded on all four sides. It's a really tight site. Um, one of the key aspects for the design was try to create new access, not only through north south Ginnells, but also between east and west. And the problem is between you've got the medieval guild hall and you've got the Victorian block, it's the access and level access. So that for us to be able to get this site to work, we've had to unlock that. Go on to the next slide, please. So the, I, I'm just going to explain the new interventions and the, the key areas where all the structural stuff happens, and which will probably interest you guys. So we've got the Medieval Guild Hall, which we're trying to uh, repurpose and get a link across between the South Range and the North Annex. To the South Range, we have um, a new um, glazed link between the two buildings. So you've got um, the... Victorian um, building on the left and then the medieval building on the right. And then you've got the North Annex to the north, which is a new build block. So if you go to the next slide. This is the grade one listed guild hall. This is what it looked like after the Blee Decker raids. It was rebuilt in the 1960s. The image to the right um, is from the 1960s and it shows you what extensive work they've done. Now, one of the key problems with the Guild Hall is getting access into it. And um, we go to the next slide, please. So what we intended to do was create um, a new access mm -hmm. down the left-hand side of the Guild Hall um, so that you could have ancillary accommodation on the left and then, which is here. And then you, the main access would be down here. And then a level access running all the way along the back of the Guild Hall. So that you could still use the guild hall when it was in use, but also um, gain access and have a route behind this screen which we're creating. You can see um, this is 1960s new timber, which um, has um, moved off its uh, pad stones. Um, so that we've we've had all sorts of issues with the previous um, restoration. So if we go to the next slide, please. So the, one of the main um, aspects for the Guild Halls are creating a new opening, a new access, level access into the Guild Hall. So this is the grid one listed wall, which technically, technically was rebuilt in the 1960s. Um, what we did is we've created a new opening and uh, Rick had to do some magic along with um, Vinci to create a new lintel um, holding the window. So if you go to the next slide. This is sort of the level of detail we've had to go into um, to try and get this new lintel in below the medieval window. Um, obviously, levels are really tight um, and all these levels were quite key to make sure that the um, scheme worked. So that's one of the main interventions in the medieval structure. If you go to the next slide. So one of the other um, challenges we've had is um, the South Range. Now, originally when we first were brought onto this project, um, the South Range wasn't listed and we had an enhanced listing and Historic England decided to list this block. At the same time, we've got, we had problems structurally with this infill block here, um, which had subsidence and um, a really uh, sporting roof. Um, so what we had to do was demolish some of it and rebuild a new block. So if you go to the next slide. So what we've done is we've built a new toilet block in here and we've also glazed in um, this area here. So that there's a new link, a new undercover link between the medieval guild hall and all this ancillary accommodation, um, which is now going to be a kitchen, toilets, um, and a new, a new link so people can mingle before they go into the guild hall. If you go to the next slide, please. This is just a section through the um, new glazed link. If you go to the next slide, please. 
and a short section to show you what we what the challenge has been in terms of getting levels in and roofs and getting a new block in alongside a, a retained um, stone structure. If you go to the next slide, please. So this is the demolition and rebuilding of that block, uh, which is was grid uh, two listed. If you go to the next slide and show the development. If you just keep going, keep going. So we've had to rebuild that block. Now, over the course of the last month, we've been installing the new structure between the medieval guild hall and the um, the Victorian block on the right, on the left, um, and this is going to be a glazed um, undercover area. And you see in the this slide here, you'll see the new opening which has been formed in the medieval wall, guild, guild hall wall. Go to the next slide. So moving on to the North Annex and, and Rick and um, and Rob, the contractor, will explain all the problems we've had in terms of this block and, and archaeology. Um, one of the main reasons for building a new block and knocking a bit a little bit of um, unlisted building down was to make sure that we had a business case and that the floor area matched up with a business plan. If you go on to the next slide. And this is the development and you can see how tight the site is. Uh, you can see the minister in the background and um, we're hemmed in on all sides. So it's been quite a challenge for the team, making sure we can get materials in and also um, getting the floor plates in and the design right. If you go to the next slide, please. This is an area, uh, fo aerial photograph of when we had knocked down the North Annex um, infill and shown you some of the problems we've got in terms of um, structural problems with the tower um, and this end block. So you can see we've got some issues there. Rick will explain a bit more about it when he uh, talks about his slides. I think that, next slide, I think that's it. Yeah, so I mean, as you can see, it's been a challenge, um, both in terms of design and also structures and also getting stuff on site. Um, but it's also coming together really well. Um, and obviously Rick will explain a bit more about some of the complexities we've had to deal with. But thank you very much. Evening everyone, uh, I'm Rick, I'm from Arab and I've been also working on this project since uh, 2015, so six years now. Uh, it's been very challenging, but uh, it's uh, very rewarding and especially at this moment in time when things are starting to come together. So I'm going to discuss the structural, structural aspects and, and what I've been trying to solve over the, over the years. Uh, as May, uh, who's May, as Faye said, there's two major uh, interventions uh, with the South Range and the North Annex. Uh, I, I'm going to discuss these briefly, but the, the, more, the, the North Annex is more kind of modern forms of construction. So I'm not going to dwell on that too much because it's fairly straightforward. Uh, uh, but the, the main challenge for the North Annex, which kind of drove the structural solution, was the kind of the logistics of getting material into the site. Uh, it's quite a big building for the, for the actual location. Uh, with some significant spans, about six meters is the largest span, uh, and also the the to meet the planning requirements, the floor to site, uh, uh, the floor to ceiling height is very constrained. So uh, that pushed the solution option. Uh, uh, there's also quite limited bracing on the elevation. So we've got quite a lot of diaphragms around the building to kind of transfer the forces around the U-shape to the cores. Uh, the south range is, 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 is small in stature, but quite complex. Uh, uh, and it had some structural issues that we fundamentally had to kind of address with kind of demolition and rebuilding of, of some portions. Uh, so the... There's a lot of history to this site. There's, uh, there's the bombing, there's historical movement. Uh, the columns went in in the 50s, are fairly green and they've, and they've shrunk during the time. Uh, there's, there's a lot of action down at basement level that uh, is, the whole site's been raised from its original 
setting of common hall lane and there was a basement under the guild hall there was there was evidence of basements underneath the south range uh, and these are layered basements with arches all over the show uh and north annex is a there's a an arch which i'm going to discuss in much more detail now so one of the main challenges on this project structurally has been uh trying to stop active movement of a crack along the uh, elevation of the tower. So the when we got on this job, uh, you could get your hand in the crack, which is kind of the, that's, that's when structural engineers start to get worried when you can put your hand in it. Uh, and since then it's moved another 20 millimeters. So this, we had no option. We had to kind of, the council had to get, uh, Real, really into this and, and we had to solve what was causing this active movement to kind of secure the future of this segment of the of the building so we, we did quite a lot of investigations uh, through all the design phase uh, with numerous contractors involved um we were still scratching our heads we, we we couldn't we had our we had our thoughts of what was causing it but it it was uh, we had no confirmation and then within probably an hour of starting the uh, underpinning works we we uh, the the fog started to lift we we found a substantial arch underneath the ground uh, as uh, as it happens it was about half a meter to the side of where we did a trial pit years ago to try and uh, try and un understand what was going on which was i guess that's just the nature of how things go but it started to kind of show us what what was causing this issue if, if you have a look at the image on the left there's you can see the the sheer amount of weight over half the building is 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 focused via the arch on a very small section of foundation uh and the any movement vertically at that location with a rotation around the, the, the springing point of the arch will, will create quite a significant crack just due to geometry. So we don't actually know what this arch is for. We've got numerous ideas. So if anyone on the call actually knows, uh, uh, I'd definitely be interested to hear about that in the future. We, we think it was spanning over something of significance or whether there was an old culvert or something, but this is a structural arch that's been put in there for a reason. So, uh, but it's caused a lot of problems and the solution was to underpin. Uh, and the, the chosen solution was uh, called a jack arch system, which uses the self weight of the structure to kind of push the piles into the ground. There's, these are driven through the uh, kind of reaction of the building self weight because there's, there's such a significant weight of wall and height of wall that you can, you can use the building to push it in rather than kind of uh, hammering it in. So, but there were, it, it was quite, there were some other unusual scenarios with the underpinning with the fact that the the north annex structure uh is is abutting it so we actually had to and that's on piled foundation so we actually have to cantilever over an entire building over the underpinning once it's in so it's very constrained it's all hidden now below ground but it was a very constrained kind of form of construction that included kind of void formers that had to be dissolved to ensure that the load from the new building is not transferred onto the existing foundations. Uh, so that was quite tightly coordinated. But this this shows you kind of uh, a plan of and how significant the underpinning kind of has been on this project to kind of needle through. And, and it, basically, it, it, we haven't really underpinned. We've created a new foundation whilst we've bypassed the new, the old foundations. Uh, so the, the arch was discovered fairly early on and it actually caused a lot of headache to the planned underpinning, which is comprised uh, needle beams through the building, uh, and which were then kind of, uh, there's these ground beams, edge beams that 
a span between the piles, uh, both internally and externally. And uh, these clashed with the arch. So it, it really kind of altered the sequence of how we could do things. We, we couldn't form all the needles we needed to because the arch was still working as an arch. So uh, it had to be a phase transfer of load from the building to the underpinning. So uh, basically when we broke through the arch, it was no longer arching and the underpinning was picking up the load. So that, that was all kind of discovered when things were on site. So there was a lot of time and effort from all involved to try and kind of scrabble together and with our thoughts and kind of adjust our plan. Uh, and this is, you can see the yellow uh, rig there. That's the, the, the jack that kind of uses the self weight of the building. And it's, it's actually you can you can just about see it, but there's a there's a lots of anchors into the into the ground being below, and it, that's how the load is transferred. It's kind of anchored down and pushes down. Uh, also on this project, we've we've been using uh, some uh, digital ad, advanced digital surveying to kind of help uh, with a number of aspects. So this was done for uh record keeping for for the for the site for the client but it also has proved invaluable for all the design team involved and especially through covid it's allowed the design team that are based around the country to visit site uh uh remotely using uh 3d models uh whenever they want from the comfort of their own home so this this has per proved invaluable and it also record it's a record of the of the building previously uh, and also we've uh, produced photogrammetry models of certain aspects which has helped uh, so this is the archaeological find in the underneath the north annex so the, the this is uh, a 3d model built from hundreds of photographs that's been post-processed into a into a photogrammic model and as you can see the the quality is photo level quality so this really captures the all aspects of of the archaeology for forever now uh, so that there's lots of in uh, ways that the this these these surveying techniques can be used in heritage projects uh, and this is just a quick photo of the current progress of the north annex so as you can see it's fairly well progressed now with the roof work starting and i won't dwell on it too much because that will uh, steal rob's funder uh, and at this point i'd like to hand over to bart who's going to talk to you about the m e aspects thank you uh, thank you, Rick. Um, hope you can all hear me. Uh, SGA Consulting are the M&E and Sustainability Consultants. Uh, we've been, we were involved in the original feasibility study in 2013. Uh, so it's great to see that the building's now finally getting going. Uh, I apologize for the number of graphs in my presentation, but um, this is to engineers and we all know engineers love graphs, so I hope that's okay. As we've heard, the buildings uh, are, are pretty much all listed uh, and when they were built, uh, energy consumption wasn't honestly anything on the agenda. So one of our main tasks was to decide how we could make the buildings as low energy and sustainable as possible without affecting the aesthetics. When I first saw the building, uh, the obvious thing to do uh, was to take heating and cooling from the River Ouse, which is a almost limited source of energy right on the doorstep, and in fact, sometimes rather above the doorstep. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Sounds good. Uh, this is a graph of energy reduction. Uh, the one on the left is the rather boring and prosaic one, but actually the one that offers the best bang for buck. For buck. Um, so we try to insulate the building as much as possible because insulation is going to be there for 100 years or more. 
whereas the M&E is there for maybe 20 to 25 years. Uh, so the new, the new parts of the building are all insulated to better than building reg standards. Uh, we've also insulated the Guildhall roof, which uh, we managed to get by trading off the, um, instead of replacing the previous lead with new lead, we've replaced it with zinc, which Historic England agreed to because it, the, the roof wasn't that old. And that then saved weight, which allowed us to then insulate the roof of the Guildhall. We've also installed some secondary glazing in some areas. These are mostly on the south facing river facade, where we get a double benefit of both reducing heat losses and also reducing the heat gains a bit. Then the other two columns here are the effect we'd get if we just upgraded the existing boiler the, the um, energy savings. And then finally, the energy savings we're getting by installing a heat pump. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a simplified schematic of the river source heat pump. So we pump water out of the river, uh, run it through a heat pump, and then we are using that to both heat and cool the building. So in winter, we're going to pump river water out that might be at about three degrees centigrade. We'll extract heat from that, cooling it to about one degree centigrade when we return it. And the heat pump will up that to about 45 degrees, which we pump around the building. In summer, we'll pump out water at maybe 22, return it at 25, and we'll cool it down to seven to pump around the building. Uh, However, at times of year, spring and autumn, we should be able to get free heating and cooling. So we'll have parts of the building wanting heating, parts wanting cooling, and hopefully we'll be able to trade those off and not need any river water. We also have gas boilers, which will provide heating to top things up if the heat pump uh, doesn't provide enough heating. Uh, it, the gas boiler will also provide heat to radiators, which we still need in some parts of the building. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a graph of the carbon saving, and it shows the saving we get from uh, going from a boiler down to a heat pump. And the saving here is basically because uh, the heat pump is taking free heat out of the uh, out of the river. The uh, third from the left column is entitled further heat pump CO2 is a bit confusing, but the issue there is the heat pump runs on electricity and the electricity grid is slowly being decarbonized. So they're getting rid of the old coal fired generators and installing many more renewables. So electricity is gradually becoming greener. The saving in summer isn't as good uh, because the alternative would be an air cooled chiller. So uh, taking cooth out of the um, river is, is better than from the air. So we get a slight improvement there. Uh, next slide, please. This is an aerial view and you can see that the site is uh, very cramped and neighbours all round. So the river source heat pump gave us a, a secondary benefit of not giving any noise to the neighbours because it's all hidden in the plant room. Uh, and also, I'm not quite sure where we would have sited a, a chiller. They wasn't giving any the planners were, were very happy not uh, with us not causing any noise because we had um, really quite acoustic constraints. Next slide, please. Um, so we used the heat from the river source heat pump uh, to um, provide heating mostly through underfloor heating. So the new buildings all have underfloor heating. We've also put underfloor heating in the guild hall. Now, there's no way that'll produce enough heat because there's just so much, it's such a large space and we've got single glazing. 
So we've had to put in some top up heating, which is trench heating, which is just heated from the boilers at about 80 degrees centigrade. However, we'll still get the underfloor heating doing about 90% of the heating through the year because, of course, most of the year it's not that cold and so we don't need the top up heating. In the Victorian council chamber, we've no choice but we have to just heat it with radiators. It, it will in the whole Victorian block because the heat losses are just too great. There's nothing we could do about it. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, this is the last graph you'll be pleased to know. Um, this is sort of showing the effect of the heating in the guild hall. So we've got a thermally massive building. What I mean by that is that nothing really happens in there very quickly. So um, when we turn the heating on, it will take a while to have any effect. Uh, when the sun switches on, Likewise, it'll take a while to have an effect. Um, anyone who's been in the Minster will realize that uh, it takes quite a long time for the Minster to get warm. You go in there in summer and it's still nice and cool. So what we're doing here is running the underfloor heating 24 seven, which will maintain the temperature fairly high. And you can see here that even in a fairly long cold spell, the internal temperature will only dip a bit. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the council chamber, um, it always suffered from being rather hot and stuffy. Uh, and this honestly, this isn't from the hot air from the councillors, it's just the number of people. Um, so it's heated by radiators, but we then have the problem of how we cool it. So we, what we've done is to put fat hide fan coil units under the existing daises. Uh, within the room and we are supplying air through the rises and the steps. Historic England were obviously quite happy with this or accepting because it's pretty much hidden away. Uh, next slide, please. Then the next issue was how we ventilate it. Um, now I've been to quite a few Victorian buildings and the Victorians were very good at installing natural ventilation systems and I thought there had to be a system here but we, we could never find it and eventually Richard Stevenson was clever enough and he found it. So what we've got is air inlets at low level behind the radiators and the air will rise to high level just by stack effect. It'll go through holes in the ceiling which are shown in the photo on the right about circle. Then they will go and the airflow will be assisted by a venturi effect from a riser from the boiler room. So essentially that's what we're doing. We're reinstating it. We can't use the link to the boiler room because of modern fire regs. So we're putting in a small fan which we will run if necessary to assist the airflow. So again Historic England are happy here because uh, we're, nothing's terribly visible within the space. And not only that, we're actually reinstating a Victorian system. Next slide, please. The original intention was to um, install PVs on the Guildhall roof. Uh, how unfortunately that would have added too much weight and the existing trusses would have need strengthening. So unfortunately that just went by the, by the wayside. Next slide, please. Uh, right at the beginning of the project, um, we were wondering where to put the plant room. Now, the obvious place is in the basement. Uh, the problem is the basement floods. And so we were trying to avoid the situation shown here. So we thought possibly we move it up to the ground floor, which would protect the rather expensive plant. However, that would have um, taken up some really quite valuable space on the ground floor. So the decision was to put it down in the basement and hopefully protect it by other, other means. Next slide, please. Uh, the red line here shows the high water mark that the basement has flooded to in the past. It shows the extent of our problem. 
So what we've done is to we've put reinforced glass on the facade of the building. We put in flood doors and installed sump pumps to um, pump the water back out into the river. And that um, I'm thinking it works very well. It certainly it worked in the pretty high floods last winter. And that um, I, it seemed quite a good test, I have to say, part of the commissioning process, obviously. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, I'm Rob Anderson. So I work for Vinci Construction and we haven't got a difficult job like all the people before me. Uh, we've got the quite simple job of just building all of this. Uh, the, um, so all I'm going to talk about is some of the challenges of the logistics of, of, and the construction that we've had to deal with. Uh, an example is below. So that is a, a floating pontoon, which we mobilised a crawler crane onto to erect our tower crane on site. And so when that was down at the site, that actually worked as a stabilised platform. So you may, may have seen some fancy pictures of similar pontoons out at sea where they're jacked out of the water. And you also see pontoons where they're fully floating. This actually works somewhere in between that. So we jack down the legs to create some buoyancy, but it's um, and somewhat lift uh, some support from the foundations and then some buoyancy effect. Um, an operation like that is quite involved for us. So we had to measure all the arches from a key further down the river to make sure that we could fit under. We also had to monitor river levels whilst we were building the pontoon and then as we were traveling up too high and we couldn't get under the bridges, too low if the water was and we couldn't drive the crane onto it. So lots and lots of challenges, lots of planning and quite fun and exciting when it happened. As you'll see from the bridge, uh, we even attracted a, a small crowd um, as, we, as we passed underneath and I was even lucky enough to make it onto Loch North that evening as it set sail. Uh, go on Rick. So similar to what other people have shown in terms of the logistics, uh, the Gildor complex is the yellow uh, and you'll, it's quite obvious that we have no road frontage and if you're building a building that's uh, quite a handy feature to have for offloading all your materials so you can pull into a lay-by, take it off your crane and build it. We haven't got that luxury. What we do have is uh, we have a couple of little alleyways that takes into site uh, which I've highlighted there. Unfortunately they're not big enough to pull any kind of construction vehicle through. So we do have to have small transit vans coming in, or we do actually manage to squeeze concrete wagons just into one of the arches and then take the concrete out of the backs of those. But to our advantage, we do have the riverfront. So just as the Romans did, we set sail from a quay, uh, Queen Stave, which is one bridge down, which is the little box at the bottom there. Uh, we, we load materials onto a, a floating pontoon. We pushed up with a tug. We bring it up alongside uh, the City Cruises boat yard where we, we've uh, set up our own mooring station and then our tar crane unloads and distributes into the site. So really efficient way of working, works really well. We can take deliveries uh, throughout the day down at Queen Stafe, whereas in the centre of York there's foot streets, so we can't take deliveries after 10.30. So that's working really well for us in terms of how we set up the site and how we deliver. Okay, Rick. So just a few slides here to show how we have to adapt our construction methods from what we would normally do on a site. So in the top left, piling rigs. So normally we on a job like this, we'd probably want to go for continuous flight auger where we'd have a big piling rig driving piles all the way to the formation. Fortunately, we couldn't do that here. So we had to do segmental flight auger where we're taking each segment one at a time to go down to the 14, roughly 14 meters. But then you also have the problem of getting the enough torque to drive the, uh, the, the, the design piles. They were 450 diameter here. There are not many rigs on the market that can fit through the alleyways that can get you into site because they're far too heavy to lift in with the tower crane. But working with our partners, Roger Bullivan, which is also part of the Vinci Group, they had one in their fleet, uh, an Italian rig, Camacho, which could actually pull its tracks in, come through the alleyway, down our ramp, then extend its tracks back out, and it had the torque that could drive the rigs or uh, the, the piles all the way down. We also had to think about our bulk earthworks. So there's quite a lot of um, reduced dig that we had to do on a site. So in a traditional job, you'd have your you know, 15, 22, 45 tonne excavator on the site doing that. And you'd have a series of eight wheelers turning up to take the muck away. We don't have that luxury. So what we did do is we commissioned a large barge that could take about 150 tonnes of material at a time. 
We loaded that with boat skips, which self tip. So you have to, you drop them down into the bottom of the barge, they unload and then you, you lower again and it clicks back into place and you bring back into sight. And then we set that sail to Ghoul where we had um, an excavator down on the, sh on the docks down there to, uh, to, ex uh, to clear the boat out and send it back to us so we could fill it again. And that process worked really well. We could just keep going in a nice steady pace as we carried on with other works on site as well. We had to have backup plans as well. So when the, when the river was high, we couldn't travel under certain bridges. So then we were able to go to our other key and unload from there as well as a backup. Rick touched on it earlier with the, um, the, the underpinning. So it's the same photo as he showed earlier. And we changed from the tender as to how we wanted to do the piling on that. So instead of using a traditional rig, we went to the jack down piles as well as it was, you know, it seems easy there on the outside of the building. We had to repeat the process inside the building as well. And so getting a piling rig inside the building would have been very difficult. And the jack down rig was nice and simple. Create, cast some anchors into the concrete and then it pushed steel tube after tube after tube down to formation again, just using a hydraulic power which was also helps to minimize, you know, vibration damage onto the building as well when you're working that close to it. And then the bottom right, selecting plant that fits. So to do the main demolition of the uh, existing North Annex before we built the new North Annex, we needed an excavator into site uh, to take it down. Ideally, if we were doing this uh, in, a, on, in a greenfield site or brownfield site, we'd use a 13 ton machine. We didn't have that luxury, couldn't get one into site. So we, we uh, managed to find an eight ton it was just uh, wide enough to fit through there. The eight ton then, uh, we had to look at the, the way we uh, took down the buildings, so that we were building a, a rubble mat beneath us so we could build our way up to get to the high points to take our way itself back down again. And then all that material went into the barge just above. And Garrick. Some of the challenges. So Bart mentioned all the flood protection systems that we've now installed and are working very effectively which is uh, which is a great bonus but of course they weren't wished in place on day one and we also had to do quite a lot of drainage works down the basement which created a lot of weak points through the basement floor so we had to cut scars in that and as soon as the river levels rose they were just weak points that the water would come through so we had to deal with flooding on a, on a semi-regular basis down in the basement pull materials back out and then back down again working in that temporary pumps where we could to try and control the water levels. We also have the flooding down at the quay. So we, uh, we have a stipulation in, the, in our environmental for, permit for working down at the quay where we have to remove materials. So what we've actually done is we created a very minimal setup down there just with lightweight Hereford's fence. So if we need to, we can pull off quite readily or we can let those just the water pass through those rather than setting up large timber hoardings and the like that would uh, float off. It was mentioned earlier by Richard and by Rick about the archaeology that was found. So we found Roman walls, medieval walls. We found a graveyard. We then found another part of the graveyard later on, plus the, the legendary old friary, um, which was believed to have been on the site, but never located. Uh, I think the archaeologists believe they found elements, more further elements of that. And that caused you know, some frustrations. Um, in terms of working around it, but it also created some opportunity. So by, able, by being able to map out exactly where all the old medieval walls were, we were able with Rick to redesign where the piles went so that we didn't have the disturbance later on in the programme. And then of course, we've been delivering a significant portion of the work through uh, a global pandemic. Uh, so there's been some new ways of working for us as well. Social distancing at the peak and wearing of masks at the peak. Luckily, we've moved a little bit past that and we've got uh, people who are able to work in a more controlled way. We've had to manage all sorts of stuff while we've been there. Thank you, Eric. Some of the other challenge. So, as Rick said earlier, you know, top left, hidden structures. So, we think we've got a plan. We had a nicely designed underpinning scheme. And then, within, like you said, an hour, we, we had to reassess what we were doing and work with various designers to, uh, to come up with new solutions. Bottom left, so we were down to strip out uh, uh, what would normally be considered a bog standard timber stud wall. As we took away all the, uh, the plastering on that, we realized that it was holding the floor above up. So luckily we've got a, a competent workforce that pick these things up pretty quickly, uh, raise it to us. We're able to then reprop the ceiling so that we could then take down the, uh, the floor above take down that wall and rebuild to the new alignments. Um, 
interestingly enough, the operative who picked that up actually won our regional safety award for his intervention there. Uh, top right is the opening that Faye talked about earlier. So originally in the scheme, we'd been asked to, and the planning consents were based around holding the window up whilst we uh, took the opening out. And we got to a point where we realized we couldn't physically hold it up without causing significant damage to the stonework to put needles through because the headroom restrictions were so tight that we weren't left with enough room to get our temporary works in without causing damage. So collective uh, working with the design team, our stonemasons, my temporary works designer, we came up with an idea where we would remove the entire window to give us the maximum working space, take down the cornice stones at the bottom, take out the wall, and then put the new lintel in and rebuild back above. And the end was, and we had to go back to planning to con get consent for that change of method. We got that, and I think the end result was absolutely fantastic. And the temporary works were massively simplified. We ended up with one piece of temporary works, which was a single prop at the bottom of where the glazing is at the moment, acting to just push out the walls, just to create um, that friction that we needed to hold up the few stones above. And then of course, bottom right, on a refurb job, there's the ever-present uh, danger of asbestos. So significant surveys done before, but you can't get into everything. So the example there, we took down a, a wall and found that behind the wall, there was some uh, lagging that we needed removing. So we're, we're constantly aware of that kind of challenge and sequencing that in, being rapid in terms of getting the um, analysis done on the materials and then getting the work done. Okay. And then just a few snaps of where we're at. So I think you've seen the one on the left, top left earlier. We're now currently uh, framing out for the roof. So that's progressing nicely and we're hoping to get watertight very quickly so that we can start doing the fit out uh, below. There's a significant amount of pipe work uh, and electrical works going out throughout the building. So the, the first fix of the m and &E is going really well. Top right, the roof is above the council chamber has actually moved on quite a bit from that, but I thought I'd leave that photo in because we have been such a significantly important room with all that lovely joinery for the, um, the benches and the like. We put a big tent over the top of the Victorian block whilst we re-roofed it and then took that down. And then bottom is the guild hall with its new roof. And you'll see there the, the, uh, the zinc roofing whilst they couldn't have the lead. It's weathering really nicely now and uh, to the untrained eye, Looks like it was uh, an old lead roof from a, from a reasonable distance. I think that's it for me, Rick. Thank you, colleagues. Um, I, I want to now focus on um, the University of York as an occupier. But before we do that, I want to just introduce you to Livia Chatton, who's the Business Development Manager at the University of York, who's going to be doing the presentation with me. What I want to focus on before we talk to you about you know, our vision and our plans for the building is just to set some context, because it's been really interesting to hear from the clients, the architects, the engineers and the contractors. And in many ways, um, why were we so excited and why is this such an important initiative for us at the University of York? Well, if we go back to um, our history and our heritage in the same way that we've been looking at the Guild Hall on, the University of York, you know, existed for public good and continues to do that. Our founders endowed the university with a really strong social purpose, you know, drawing on a rich tradition of thought and action. And the Guild Hall is instrumental in doing that. So these principles encompass and extend, I guess, for us, beyond a view of higher education that's just simply focused on economic impact. Our work clearly does and should bring economic benefits, but our ideas should enable businesses and other organisations within the region and beyond to innovate and flourish. And that's why the Guild Hall is so important to us. Our ambition isn't simply to you know, um, to focus on the economic impact alone. Our ambition for the Guildhall is to create a space where we put our expertise and the impacts that we have to help create the conditions needed for all parts of society to flourish. So the Guildhall is an important space for us because it's not simply about a building, it's about its history, its heritage, 
and how the space could be um, a future enabler, you know, so bringing the space back to life in the same way that the vision of the architects, um, you know, and the contractors have helped sort of um, embed. So a space that contributes to our vision for public good in the city and in the region. And what we want to try and do is take the opportunity to connect the innovations drawn from the research of the university and the talents of our graduates, but also to the economic, cultural and social development of the city and the region, because that's so important. So as occupiers of the Guildhall, what we want to do is to work in harness with our local authority, with the economic development bodies and government and all the kind of agencies that help us connect our local communities to nurture and develop a thriving cluster of activities from working with SMEs who are so embedded in the city and in the region, but also try and draw in wider investment um, to provide social and cultural spaces, as well as a commitment that the Guildhall has a local and a community purpose. So how is this all gonna kind of you know, um, operate? So I'm delighted to have Olivia Chatton, who's the business and development manager, who's played such an instrumental role in helping us shape the operations and the vision of the Guildhall. We could move on to our next slide and if I could introduce you to Olivia. Thanks, Kieran. Um, so yeah, as Kieran mentioned, Business Development Manager at the University and the Science Park. Um, I'm sure many of you know um, who the Science Park are and um, we've operated for 30 years based on the university campus. We support around 130 companies currently and we want to extend that support into the city centre, into the Guildhall. Um, the new space in the Guildhall will enable the university to bring all of the support that it offers businesses currently right into the heart of York um, and enable us to drive inclusive and sustainable growth as the city recovers from you know, what arguably is the, the sort of um, worst period, particularly in my lifetime, that businesses and local people have ever suffered. So um, we're really sort of passionate about making sure that um, you know, the university is, is acting as a university for public good and um, going back to our roots. Within the Guildhall, we will provide flexible workspace and business support for entrepreneurs and startups. Um, we work really closely in collaboration with bodies such as Make It York and the City Council um, and other um, business support providers in York. And we'll offer opportunities for business, businesses to start, grow and scale their businesses within our centre um, through incubator, accelerator and scale up facilities. Um, you might be asking uh, yourself why office space at this current time? Um, so the space itself um, has been really neatly set out um, thanks to the sort of um, future thinking of the council and the architects and everybody involved um, in such a way that the space will allow for collaborative working. So in actual fact, there isn't that many um, offices individually and there's about 12 and um, the rest of the space for businesses is hot desking, co-working, a business lounge, more of a communal feel. Um, and our furniture and all our furnishings will, will reflect that. Um, our sort of colleagues in York conferences will be supporting us in running events um, and we'll do fairs, festivals, weddings, as well as supporting the local community with um, anything that they wish to put on, such as York Mystery Plays. I'm sure many of you um, have been or, or know about that. Um, also, there will be public realm improvements in this. And we're really keen to stress that, you know, um, during the hours of sort of 8.30 till 5.30, Monday to Friday, the space is accessible for um, anybody that is interested, so long as it's not an event on. Um, so feel free to, um, as soon as we're open, pop to reception, um, we can give you a, a tour around the building um, and you can grab a cup of coffee in our cafe. Um, so the cafe will be open um, in sort of normal working hours and it is open to the public. So you'll be able to um, come and enjoy a nice cup of tea by the river. Um, and then we are working with the Mansion House to provide um, public tours um, and thinking about that history and heritage and how we can um, inspire the next generation um, and teach them, you know, um, about the Guildhall and the Mansion House's past um, and what, you know, um, this means for them. 
Um, we also really want to ensure that we support community groups. So we're looking to host things like the York Inclusion Festival next year, which will bring together um, such a diverse range of, of people within York. Um, and we hope that, you know, the, the university will also host plenty of events there, um, which I'm sure most of them are open to the public anyway. So really that's um, the sort of operational um, way that we will be working and we're really excited and really looking forward to hopefully getting in towards the end of this year. Um, I've left our contact details there. If anybody has any sort of follow-up questions or um, would like to, to chat to me or Kieran further, but um, yeah, just a great, great thanks to the whole team that have, um, that have put all this to, uh, together and, and done the refurb and we're, we can't wait to get in. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone that that brings us to a conclusion and uh, I yeah. guess open it up for questions which I think John said he'd uh, he'd manage <laughs> and, right well yes can I add my uh, thanks to all the speakers I mean, it's absolutely fascinating um, at the moment I'm having my uh, kitchen rebuilt and uh, it uh, puts it into perspective where I see the problems that you've had but, uh, um, yeah, you, you've obviously had to think on your feet and uh, develop things as problems uh, appear. Uh, absolutely fascinating. So um, moving on to questions. If I go through the questions that were uh, put into the chat box, first of all, and then open it up to, to the meeting. Um, so uh, just running through the comments in the chat box. Um, well done for Richard. Good to get the background about uh, why we are doing this uh, from, from uh, Roy Wallington. Thank you, Richard. Um, for me and Tempest, um, some impressive aerial or rooftop photographs in these slides. Are they available online? Many residents will be fascinated. Um, They're not online at the minute. They were taken from a bucket which I was in when I was surveying the stonework to the um, front elevation. So I made the crane driver go as high as I could to take a <laughs> photograph looking down. It's a bit more sophisticated than a bucket, Faye. <laughs> <laughs> I, can hear, I can hear health and safety in the background there. <laughs> yeah, I just had to get a really good shot. What I would like to do at the end of the project before the crane gets taken down is taking one view again in the same place so that you can see the development of the site. Because that's, I mean, that's what's been so interesting about working on this job is that the site has developed over the years, over the decades, over the centuries, in fact. And everything that we add, we're hoping to add another layer of history. And um, so, yeah, it's good to document it for future generations. Yes, um, I mean, this this talk and the presentation is hopefully going to go online on the York Society of Engineers website. Um, and I think also the University of York website. Um, is there going to be any physical exhibition um, when the uh, refurbishment is completed? Um, any, any photographs going to be displayed then? Um, any videos? Will that be part of the, do, the opening? Um, we do have... Um, some time-lapse photographs which need editing. Uh, Rob has a camera on the building opposite um, and there is some fascinating stuff. I think between the team and the client we've got so much documentation we would need to start thinking about editing it so that I mean what is fascinating is the development of the, of the scheme but also development of the site um, over the years so we will have to talk to uh, CYC about how, how we present that. Yeah. So certainly the materials there, it's, it's just um, how it's potentially going to be presented. It's yeah, it needs to be it needs to be collated because it is, I mean, we have got so much documentation. Rob takes about 10 photographs a day and sends it on a daily report. So um, there is a massive catalogue of information. Right. Thanks, Faye. Um, uh, now, a comment from John here. Um, this is in respect to the uh, matter that you raised, Rick, on, on the foundation. 
Uh, and the comment is, looks like a foundation arch as per the 14th century city wall between Red Tower and Walmgate Bar. City engineer at the time, Enoch G. Morby, would have been familiar with the system. John Shaw, and YAYAS, not sure what that stands for, might it explain why he left his post shortly after this was built in 1889? Um, uh, yeah, that's really, really useful. I'll, I'll try and hunt down that uh, red tower and what uh, one I've not, yeah. I'm not familiar with that. But uh, yeah, yeah that, that's really interesting. Thank you. I saw that. I thought I saw that message come up, and I was trying to find the engraving of the scheme, which was meant to be a button, the tower. So there was an etching in Victorian times where they had mirrored the council chamber and the tower mm. sat in the middle and that it, there was meant to be another building against the tower, but that didn't happen. So, but I couldn't find the image to show you, but it's re it is really interesting that it wasn't meant to be a blank facade. So it's blank gable and it shouldn't have been like that. There should mm. have always been a building there. That doesn't explain the engineering though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, Rick touched on it earlier when he said, you know, it might have been poor ground conditions that caused the arch to be there. But, but, and he also said that we couldn't find the reason. We, we yeah. drove some test piles in that vicinity to see if the stiffness of the soil changed. We did some pile probing and, and nothing picked up anything odd. But you mm. are shooting blind when you're doing that kind of work. Mm. So, so just Yeah, sorry, John, just sorry. Just uh, you were raising your hand there. Yes, it's. Um, the 14th century, it's the same thing on the wall, that it was an answer to the soft conditions because of the height of the foss, the water table, that the medieval engineers decided to put for the first time foundation arches under the city wall, which doesn't exist anywhere else on the circuit. And it was in response to particular conditions. And it just occurred to me because of the water table on that side and the relatively high slope of the land, that that would be a kind of Victorian engineer solution. But I noticed it's like a torsional crack as well. It's yeah. a rotational crack as well as a foundational crack. And um, the cynic in me says, it's no wonder Morby only survived as city engineer for two years. It's the shortest tenure of any city engineer. Right. <laughs> so maybe it cracked fairly soon. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's interesting about it, we're calling it the tower. It, uh, and it's actually not a tower because it's it's not supported on two sides internally. It's sort of... It's a glorified not got no, chimney. It, yeah, basically. Mm. Yeah. It's not a tower because the walls don't come all the way down. It's really um, yeah. interesting engineering. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you for that uh, information, John. That's uh, yeah, thanks. For that. It's, it's food for thought for, for the team. Um, next one is from David. Um, question for Rick uh, regarding the foundations of the South Range. Did the basements and cellars of the original South Range provide the pile-free support? What's the problem arch part of this structure? Uh, repeat that again, sorry. Um, did the basements and cellars of the original South Range provide the pile-free support? And was the problem arch part of this structure? Uh, we don't think the problem arch was part of that because it was the opposite end of the site. Uh, we, we didn't actually uncover the foundation the basement underneath the south range and we don't know if there was one or we don't know what kind of the logic was behind there the new build portion was piled so and we hit no obstructions through the piling works uh oh we hit one we had to move one uh slightly but uh, we we think it may have been a uh, washout from uh, historical drainage issues in the area. Uh, I remember being in the basement one day and it was almost like a, a waterfall coming through the wall uh, from from the drainage. So there was there's there was and that got sorted and everything started to dry up quite quickly. But there's even when you're down in the basement, you can see the tops of arches which we don't know what they, they were built for or what purpose they were, but there's obviously, uh, and so there's a basement below the basement potentially. There's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of history on this site that we, 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 we literally just scratched the surface of and we, we kind of 
we didn't go looking, if that made sense. Yes, yeah. Um, I can imagine that as built draw as built drawings were in short supply. Yeah. Um, right, thank you for that uh, response, Rick. Um, comment from Roy Warrington, um, which I can also uh, second. Great to see the digital innovation. You know, the um, that uh, photogrammetry you had for the archaeology, uh, fascinating. Yeah, the the kind of the 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 techno the technological jump in in digital surveying is, uh, recently is is it marries well to kind of refurbs especially of historic nature. It kind of it it captures it brilliantly and uh, it really so just like being able to do a photogrammetry model of the underpinning allowed me to have a really detailed conversation with engineers in our London office uh, and then really understand what I was asking and, and kind of get to grips with the problem without coming to site so it was it was really helpful to, to try and speak to other members of the of the Arab community absolutely it's been, it's been invaluable for the architects as well being able to walk around in fact every client which I have at the minute I'm advising them to go down the route of a Matterport or a digital image I think it's the best mm. thing to be able to capture the building at that time yeah because I mean a lot of LIDAR was the, the go-to thing, but the, it, you, for the Guildhall, if you did a full LIDAR scan of that, you probably have 200, 300 gigabytes of data. And it's the post-processing of that is just uh, really hard work for the design teams and you don't get the, the full benefit from it. So yeah, the, the leaps in digital technology now, are, you, you won't be getting a topographical 2D survey now, you'll be getting 3D models from your surveying companies. Yes, it's uh, difficult to keep speed with the uh, pace of change sometimes. Yeah. Um, question from uh, Dave Ruddock. Um, any information of Common Hall Lane? Will it open again under supervision? Mm, bring you Ellie. It was, it was never really open. It was only ever by appointment because it's not really accessible. It's sort of slippy steps and in most times when there's been regular floods in the bottom of there's a lot of sediment and you can't hardly stand on it's very slippy uh, and the, the lighting well there is going to be permanent lighting in there but it's really more of a service area I mean there will possibly be tours that are organized for people who can ably get down there um, but uh, the only thing that really does uh, reside down there on a regular basis is the mink which we, we get to see on on uh, on occasion. Oh, originally, as well. originally as part of a competition brief, our original scheme did have new openings and links coming down, so north to south, and there was talk of having a riverside walk from east to west, because um, obviously you've got the platform um, towards the cinema and Vodka Rev, but you're kind of missing a bit in the middle before you get beyond uh, the bridge at Lendl. Um, but maybe one day that will happen. There is talk know. of the Riverside Walk, Faye, but it's not down at that level. It's yeah. uh, a lot, a lot higher. Right. Thank you. Um, now we have um, thanks to the speakers um, from Rachel uh, Bateson and Dr. Matthew Brook, um, all congratulating you. Fascinating talk, um, Dave Ruddock. Um, will Olivia like to chat to your past and present? Absolutely, yeah. Just please do drop me a, a line, I'm sure. Um, John can share my details and um, that'd be great. Right, yeah, that, that, that certainly sounds it. Um, like a possible future talk for the York Society of Engineers as well, Olivia, please. So, um, from Amy Thompson, West Yorkshire. Archaeological Society. Um, now, I'm not quite sure, Amy, what um, what you were suggesting there with, um, with the West Yorkshire Archaeological Society um, looking for a talk or... Um, 
Not sure on that one. She was just saying that it was an acronym that she didn't understand at first, and it's in the chat now that it's... Uh, ah, she's, right. Uh, yeah. Right, I see. And Right, and this is one for me. Yah Yars is the Yorkshire Archaeolog Architectural and York Archaeological Society. Thank you. I, I'm now educated on that one. Uh, Roxanne Pendlebury. Uh, again, thanks for such an interesting talk. So excited to be able to visit the Guildhall when it re reopens. An amazing collaborative effort. Um, similarly, Jill Tasker, really interesting talk. David Stothart, again. Silk Toy. Um, Fascinating talk for an interested lay person. Right. So many, lots of thanks from people and some good questions there. So that's all the chat questions. Um, can I open it up to the um, rest of the attendees, please? Um, either physically raise your hand so that um, we can see it or um, raise your hand under, under the reactions box. Kieran. Thank you. I was really fascinated because this project um, has got collaboration almost in its DNA, you know, and, and, and through that kind of, um, and just hearing, you know, from the contractors, from the client, you know, to the university working together. You know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how that collaboration has actually worked in practice, because there's huge learning isn't that, in, in, in that. You know, when we work together, the difference that we can actually make but then also been able to retain, um, you know, the ethos and the heart of the, the, the Guild Hall. So people's just experience of, of working collaborative and what, what that felt like, not just the highs, but some of the kinds of tensions and the lows, which they oh, must have in the way. Yeah, we have, we have tensions now and again, yes. I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, I think right from the get-go, from the time when we, we were picked by the client in terms of the design team, um, we picked the right team. So basically we've worked with Arup before, we've worked with SGA before. We know complexities of this kind of site and what kind of comes up. And I think um, for us to be able to unlock this historic asset and actually repurpose it for uh, 21st century, um, you know, office working and co collaborative working, we all had to work as a team. What was interesting about this project in particular um, was that we tried to go down a two-stage tender route um, with um, a different contractor and it didn't work. And then Vinci came along and it became almost a collaborative effort in terms of when things have come up on site, you have to act fast. Otherwise, you're not going to, you know, there's going to be a delay. So I think the best way for our team is being communication, really always communicating with a client, communicating with a contractor and picking the phone up, you know, it always helps just to talk and talk three things through and, and not coming with airs and graces and I want it done this way. It's basically, no, it's what's best for the building. It's not best for anyone's ego or anything like that. What we need to do is make sure that this building survives another hundred years. And that's what our ultimate goal has been. And I think the product and the aspirations and the, the end um, finishes will achieve that. I think that's what's, what's key really for that building. I don't know what anyone else thinks to probably say, shut up, say, we talk too much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Faye, that's really, that's really important. You know, because, you know, we talk about heritage and we talk about legacy, you know, and I'm, you know, really mindful of what Livia said, that we've also got to, you know, almost um, inspire another generation of young people, you know, to value the things that we have, but create spaces that open up, I guess, you know, new activity. So that was really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. On, on that, Kieran, as well, is that you're a client as well for the university. Uh, I'm generally a client for the council. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned with regards to enabling your consultants and people you hire in to do work because there's no point just giving them a job and forgetting about them. You really do need to try and remove barriers within your own organisation to make sure that they can actually just get on with their job without worrying about other things. So it's, I think enabling people that you have actually uh, engaged to do a task is, is key. 
rather than just leaving them out there on a on a limb. Yeah. So so you need to just bit- try and gel everybody together and make sure that yeah. everybody's uh, getting looked after really. And believing in the brief, because at the end of the day, it was a really difficult. It is a really difficult brief. It has been a complex project. It is still a complex project, but you are going to get that end product. So, and the brief from the client was really succinct. They knew exactly what they wanted. They knew how they wanted to bring this building back into use. And getting the university on board is is basically the end goal. You know, so I think it's going to be a great project when it finishes. Yeah, and we're really excited about it. You know, we're really excited about it, not just for incubation and business space, but, you know, um, you know, you were talking about, you know, the photographs and the history. How do we tell that story on the walls of the building um, so that as other people, as the public come in, you know, they're as passionate and engaged about it, I guess, as we are. And I think, you know, Richard, you make a really, really important point. You know, there is no point in having universities as anchor institutions in our region if we don't work in partnership. And, you know, that does lie at the heart of, you know, what we want to do, not just now, but as we move forward in the future. Um, if I could just um, uh, highlight Roy Warrington's comment in the chat box here, which sort of links into that. Um, delighted to see all this expertise and excellent management put to good use in York. For hundreds of years, people will thank you for that. Well done, team. So you know, you've created a legacy, which is is great. Um, so, any more questions uh, from the members or guests? Trying to see if anybody's raising their hand. No. Can I just ask, just for for my benefit, one uh, simple engineering question? Um, What about sewerage? Um, Were there any issues with that? Um... Uh, Yes. Uh, Our uh, our civil engineer uh, isn't on the call. Uh, I don't know who best place. Probably Rob had probably got his hands dirtiest with this one. But yeah, the the drainage was uh, a problem, uh, qu- quite problematic for us, uh, especially when we put loads of piles through the site. It didn't help getting the uh, the drainage through. Yeah, I mean the hardest part was trying to tie back into existing because we always had to find a way back out of the site. You know, so we had you know ultimate endpoints where we're trying to get to. And unfortunately, it was. You know, by the time you get to those, it was usually pretty deep. So you sort of, you know, in some cases, sort of four meters down and trying to get the run. And then when you wanted it to be deep, it was shallow. So it was trying to get underneath parts of the building, you know, at the minimal force. So it was still self cleansing. Um, and there's only one occasion where we've had to do a sort of a pumped um, manhole, um, which is in the south range where there is no natural way of returning the new building to the, to the inner so it's all under gravity. Uh, which is which is good from a long term point of view, um, and then we did have one sewer crossing the site that was unrecorded uh, from a neighbour's property. So having to work around that, which we did successfully again with the help of Rick's colleague uh, from our civils, you know, working a way of you know putting in a temporary diversion on that, piling either side of it, and then reinstating it. So yeah, it's, it's good one of them. the other key things, Rob, was um, we've only just recently completed changing the. The infamous penstocks in the basement, yeah. which have been the source of most of the the flooding, yeah. and uh, and we've got two nice brand new ones on there, and yeah. they were turned shut previously on a fairly decent flood, yeah. and we prior to that we had acro props on manhole lids, we had bungs <laughs> down, open drains, we had pieces of wood from the ceiling propping all of those down, there was water coming in all over the place like a Dutch dam. And uh, once we'd actually uh, sorted out these penstocks and put, we put um, armoured glass on the outside of the windows, the full height of the uh, of the basement, because the EA kindly lifted their wall at the other side of the river halfway through our project, so the existing armoured glass wasn't high enough. Uh, so we have to thank them for a little bit of extra cost on there. Uh, we've got new um, doors that would not disgrace a submarine on the the outside and our boiler rooms so we do have percolation through the structure uh, but we instead of now having two single pumps in um, 
in in sumps in the basement we ha we now have uh four sets of duplicated pumps uh which are hard piped rather than hoses that just used to be hanging out of the windows uh we have our windows properly blocked up we have new doors on everything and we've got a second line of defense with uh with the boiler rooms being behind and a second set of flood doors uh, with two sets of pumps outside, two sets of pumps inside, and an alternative uh, access and egress to get into the boiler room when the doors are locked down for a flood. So we have tested that, and we're we're confident that that's going to uh, going to um, work for us in the future. Sorry about that. The first telephone and, call. And, and all in a Grid Two Star listed building. Mm -hmm. So. As you can imagine, it was difficult getting planning permission for most of the things what we were intended to do. So, um, yeah. Right, thanks, thanks for that. Um, any more questions um, from the audience or any of the speakers? No, I think well, that's probably it. It's, it's nine o'clock now, so I think that's... Uh, uh, rounded off things very well. Um, just like to once again thank all the speakers for um, superb talk um, and to, to the members and guests for attending. Um, it's been a record attendance for the York Society of Engineers talk. We, we ha we've had 100, 100 um, attendees, which is very good. I think it just emphasises the level of interest in the project you've been working on. So thank you all very much again. Thank you. And we hope to see you when it opens as well. So we hope you get to all have a look around us. I'm sure Olivia will welcome you all with open arms. Um, maybe Hello, have then. some open days. So, yeah. Yeah, we've got um, hopefully um, uh, a day and an evening launch. And then, um, you know, welcome you all for a, a cup of tea and some, uh, some tours. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Good. Thank you. Everyone. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks very much. And just one for Rick. Uh, Rick, um, is it possible to get a copy of the?